Well, OK, we'll get underway. So uh, welcome to the latest in our guest speaker series. Um, as a quick introduction to Oxford Brain Diagnostics for Mallow, um, we're an Oxford University spin out uh, with a method for analysing brain MRI based on cellular structures. And we're working towards a clinical tool for early detection uh, of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, which we want to be used uh, by clinical services and uh, drug developers. Um, and so today we're delighted to have Professor Manu Tanzi join us. Um, uh, she studied biological science at Stanford University, followed, uh, I believe, by a PhD in cell regulation at UT Southwestern. Um, uh, and also, Malu, you worked for a time for private uh, biotech company Zencore, I believe, um, but bef that was before returning to academia. So uh, now um, Malu is co-director of the Center for Translational Research in Neurodegenerative Disease and the Norman and, Fick and Susan Fixel Chair in Neuroscience and Neurology at the University of Florida. And I believe your lab is, is focused on inflammation uh, and immune system responses uh, to brain health and disease and, and hopefully identifying disease early. Uh, and so we're really happy to have you talking to us today about uh, targeting chronic inflammation to lower the risk of Parkinson's disease. Uh, take it away, please. Mallow. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, in fact, I am very happy to be here. Um, and let me share my screen and get this PowerPoint up. Can you see that? Perfect, yeah. Okay, fantastic. So thank you again. Um, today I hope to take you through um, a few ideas and studies that we have done in the space of peripheral and central inflammation in Parkinson's disease. I'll focus on that. Um, to give you some thoughts about um, potential biomarkers and therapeutic opportunities. And so we think about uh, the perfect storm for Parkinson's development as something that really starts before the um, uh, neurons are lost. Um, the clinical symptoms, you know, um, begin quite late in the development of the disease and they happen um, once you lose enough dopaminergic neurons and you cross this threshold and you have motor symptoms that a neurologist can then use to diagnose um, a uh, stage three uh, practically um, in the office. Um, there's also non-motor symptoms, which we'll talk about shortly, but many of these symptoms um, can sometimes precede the motor stages uh, and they can start as early as two decades. And we believe that the best uh, opportunity for arresting um, the disabling motor symptoms is to focus on this pre or prodromal stage of Parkinson's development. Um, we understand that the earlier the diagnosis, uh, the better the chances of uh, allowing progression. And so what we believe is that the immune system is the best weather vane for uh, understanding that a neuron is in trouble, whether that be the immune system in the brain, microglia, or the communication between the brain and the periphery, um, because there's a very important crosstalk that occurs. And so as you're aging, we know that immune cell function declines, and that's depicted here. Um, we know that the immune cells um, change in profiles as you're aging. You become more pro-inflammatory and you also have less immune competence and you have more immunosenescence. And so this aging process really tips the balance in terms of a pro-inflammatory, less immunocompetent stage. And we believe that that contributes to the risk of development of these age-related neurodegenerative diseases. There's also an interplay with genes and gene variants that may predispose you and sometimes protect you against development of age-related neurodegenerative disease. And the third component is your environmental exposures and environmental triggers um, that can include anything in this bucket, right? Um, infections, exposures in the environment, um, lifestyle choices, et cetera. And so we talk about all of this in the Nature Review Immunology um, that is uh, article that is in press at the moment. 
And so with this in mind, we have taken the approach that we need to focus on the prodromal two decades or so before this uh, onset of the even the, the um, non-motor motor stages and, and think about what are the things that we can focus on in the immune system and in terms of inflammation, maybe in the periphery that will give us some clues about people at risk or even allowing us to stratify patients that would be suitable for immunomodulatory anti-inflammatory approaches that could um, delay or arrest the progression of their disease. And so this is from another um, review in movement disorders where we talk about this convergence of um, environmental factors that disrupt immune homeostasis and increase the risk for PD. Many of these can alter immune cell function through possible changes in expression of the key genes that are related to Parkinson's, such as the nuclein, LARC2, uh, MHC2, pink and parkin, and they can alter the inflammatory cytokine production. They can also uh, alter the proliferation of autoreactive T cells and production of self-directed antibodies. And they can also lead to direct tissue damage. Um, and I'll talk about uh, gut microbiome changes and intestinal inflammation today. And all of these will lead to systemic inflammation, which then contributes in lots of different ways to neuroinflammation and can hasten the um, onset of neurodegeneration for those vulnerable populations. And it's not all populations that appear to be vulnerable, but only um, several, and, and the dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra appear to be uh, in, that, in that category. So many years ago, uh, C.J. Barnum, who was a postdoc in my lab, and I, I believe some of you know him through the work at ImmuneBio, we were um, hypothesizing that TNF, uh, or tumor necrosis factor, was a, a bad actor in this um, highway from um, the gut to the brain, that it probably played a role in fueling chronic inflammation um, at stage one in the potential gastrointestinal dysfunction that's part of the non-motor symptoms, which I'll discuss in the next slides, and stage two, which included, you know, things like depression and sleep disturbances, um, stage three, which is the motor deficits, and then finally, a lot of different patients become um, cognitively impaired and and demented. And so we um, hypothesized that it was the dark passenger of Parkinson's disease and that if we paid attention to the chronic inflammation, we might be able to uh, make a big dent into a lot of these um, symptomologies and, and mechanisms. And so we began by looking at, you know, could we think about uh, candidate inflammatory biomarkers by looking at plasma or, or serum in individuals? and and there was been a, there's been a lot of interest, as you know, in fluid biomarkers. And the problem with this is that if you are going to look at cross-sectional studies, you really want to find biomarkers that are, you know, ideally static, that are not changing throughout the day, because you don't know what time the, the blood draw was done. And so we had a Fox Foundation um, funded award that was uh, allowing us to ask the questions on the lower right side. And we wanted to know, are these serum and CSF cytokines or proteins associated with node generation stable across the day or did they fluctuate? And were they different between healthy controls and PD subjects? And then we wanted to know, do the serum protein levels reflect CSF protein levels, right? Or are there different associations that we could see uh, in the first sample and then across the day? And were these different in PD or, or controls? And then we wanted to know, was there a relationship between serum or CSF inflammation and CSF markers, right? Is, it, is there a direct correlation or not? And then finally, we wanted to know if any of these markers uh, in CSF or serum could help discriminate between healthy controls and PD. You know, could, could they actually help us classify in a blinded manner. And so it was a small group, 12 PD subjects and um, six controls. But the beauty of this uh, study was that we had samples every two hours um, and they were collected by the Fox Foundation many years ago um, in a very controlled study. And, um, and then they were collected, again, matched CSF and, and blood samples. 
and um, we basically ask you know those questions. And and I'm just going to summarize the data because this is published, but it's very interesting. We found three major categories, right? So in the blue far left, we found some that were variable across time and not different between PD and healthy control. So not too terribly interesting as a quote biomarker, right? And those are examples. And CSF TNF was one of them, serum IL-6 and CSF IL-8. And you can see those profiles. In the middle, we had some that were variable ac across time and different between PD and healthy control. So those are you know, potentially more interesting as potential biomarkers that could help differentiate. But notice how over time, these tend to tick up, right? So we think that's a methodological artifact that people were either getting anxious, they weren't sleeping. You know, if you have a cath indwelling catheter over, you know, the 24 hours, you're not going to be, you know, you're going to be a little stressed. So that that's a function of, of the methodology, and we acknowledge that. Uh, the A beta, the synuclein, the A beta 42, those all ticked up, but not everything did, as you can see. And the last uh, uh, bucket was the far right, the serum TNF, the serum lipocalin or NGAL, and the serum interferon gamma were different between the two groups and very little variability across time. So if you were going to pin your hat on a nice biomarker, that would be the group because you don't have to worry about in, in the future, potentially, you know, uh, a difference between uh, sampling um, time in the day. So we recognize that this is a small sample and that, you know, the way that they sampled could influence the uh, results. And so this obviously needed, needs to be, you know, checked in a, in a much bigger, um, in a much bigger group of, of subjects. We found some interesting rhythms that were disrupted in PD subjects. And so this, I think, also bears further investigation. The, um, the ones in green are the ones that were disrupted in PD uh, and not, you know, were more no intended to, to be different between the two. And then the very interesting thing, which I always talk about, and, um, and, and one of the reasons that, um, you know, immune bio and, and, and uh, Barnum and others have used CRP as a uh, a good biomarker is CRP is the only analyte that is positively correlated in um, both groups at baseline, right, between serum and CSF. It's a very good, strong correlation, always has been in almost every group that we've measured it in, depression, AD, PD. It's, a, it's an order of magnitude higher in the serum than in the CSF, but it's a very nice linear relationship. So if you tend to have high CRP peripherally, it's going to be high centrally. The others are very independent. The cytokines are doing very, you know, different things potentially peripherally and centrally. And so many years ago, again, we wrote a review telling people that we thought, yes, um, innate and adaptive immunity are important in PD. Um, and it's more about more than microglia. It's about peripheral immune system. You need to pay attention to um, the uh, B cells, T cells, peripheral monocytes because they have a conversation with the brain and the immune system is in a perfect uh, position to be the arbiter of this G times E or gene by environment interaction. And so now I'm going to switch gears and tell you a little bit about what we have found in the periphery in terms of uh, immune cells, not just fluid biomarkers. Because what I hope to convince you of is that it's not sufficient to just look at the biofluids because sometimes the cells um, are doing things that may, may tell you more, more interesting things. And so this is a study that we did. Um, uh, Darcy Cook, a graduate student, immunology graduate student in the lab did um, on LARC2 levels in immune cells, right? And so what we wanted to know is uh, the levels of LARC2 protein, which is, as you know, uh, one of the PD genes, also a gene in inflammatory bowel disease, um, are those different in Parkinson's, sporadic Parkinson's or controls? And so we did uh, human immunophenotyping by flow cytometry to pull out all these populations in a group of uh, 40 PD and 32 healthy controls that were pretty well matched in terms of ages and, you know, smoking and caffeine, NSAIDs, head injuries. Um, this, the sex was a little bit skewed because we always tend to have more males with PD than females. And interestingly, this is also published, so I'm just going to go through it quickly. The monocytes from in 
uh, sporadic PD patients secreted more pro-inflammatory cytokines than the healthy controls. This is a very controlled experiment in the dish. The reason we like it is because you're not sampling from the pipe, right, from the serum, uh, and that's influenced by how much sleep they got, are they stressed, sometimes how you put the tourniquet in the, in the arm. This is a very controlled experiment, right? It's an ex vivo stimulation of cells. And what we think this does is it allows you to get to an inflammatory trait, not an inflammatory state as a snapshot in time of what that patient was doing right when he was in your office or she was in your office. And so this allows you to really interrogate the cells themselves. And it's a lot more uh, reproducible when you do it from, you know, week to week from the same patient. And so this is this is what we find. In the green, you see um, the, the PD uh, subjects and the blue is the healthy controls. Um, and and I'm sorry, that's not labeled, but that is that is what you see. And so here again, green is PD, blue is healthy control and we see that the LARC2 protein is globally upregulated in all T cell subsets in idiopathic PD. Again, blue is PD, green, uh, sorry, blue is healthy control, green is PD, and you see uh, a big variability. That's important to notice. Um, we see a lot of variability in human um, uh, immunophenotyping, but you can see uh, that the statistically significant um, differences are there and the Parkinson's population in green always has more LARC2 protein in all the T-cell subsets, memory subsets, helper subsets, and we found this very interesting, right? And so this could either mean that LARC2 protein is a bad thing, right, because it's elevated in PD, or the hypothesis we prefer to put forth is that it may be elevated as an adaptive response to bring down inflammation, right? The inflammation that we see circulating in, in many patients and, uh, and, and the inflammation that you're seeing in, in some of these cells. So in, in that same paper, I don't want to show you the data, but in that same paper, we were able to show that if you take T cells and B cells and monocytes and you just activate them in the dish, you can see LARC2 levels go up on a timeline that mirrors the activation of these cells and the deactivation of these cells. So it really looks like it's activated with a kinetics consistent with it playing an important role in normal activation of immune cells, which is why I always wonder and worry about therapeutics that target LARC2 without us fully knowing the important roles that it plays in the immune system. So I think that's that's the lesson that we that we need to continue to explore. Now it's been shown by many others, Jim Greenemeyer's group and both of his trainees, uh, Brianna de Miranda and uh, Emily Rocha, that LARC2 is a regulator of selective vulnerability to environmental stressors associated with PD risk, and they've shown that you know it's important for lysosomal uh, function and some of the um, uh, Industrial solvents uh, may uh, impinge upon these pathways, and LARC2 kinase activity may be important to arbitrate um, those uh, those triggers and those responses. And so, let me summarize. Up until now, what we've seen is that we see increased cytokine secretion in monocytes and all T cell subsets in idiopathic PD. We see increased MEC2 expression and cytokine secretion by monocytes in IPD, and that was a counter cut it all study that was published in, in 2015 that I didn't get to talk to you about, but it's there. And we see increased proliferation of CD8 and uh, T cells in, in IPD, which you know us and others have published. And so it paints a picture of maybe not everybody, but a good percentage of, of subjects with idiopathic PD seem to have immune inflammatory dysregulation. And then we see in some studies positive correlations between LARC2 expression levels in T cell subsets, cytokine expression and secretion and T cell activation states that strongly suggest that targeting LARC2 with therapeutic interventions will likely have direct effects on immune cell function. So if you have a mutation in LARC2 and you're disrupting immune function, then yes, you should target it and fix it. But if we're just going to be bringing down levels of LARC2 because we think they're uh, not a good thing to have, I think we need to be very careful with that. So back to the highway, because we're interested in where else is playing a role, we wanted to interrogate 
the role of chronic inflammation in the gut. And we know that neuroinflammation can contribute to neurodegeneration by a lot of people's work in preclinical studies. What is the trigger for that? Well, presumably we know that inflammation can induce synuclein aggregation, lots of different studies in vivo, in, in animals and, you know, injecting LPS and causing, you know, synuclein to go up and, and aggregated synuclein is pro-inflammatory, so it's kind of a feed-forward cycle. And inflammation in alpha-synuclein, we know, can promote DA neuron death, um, dopaminergic neuron death. So, you know, the pieces are there, but how do you really, you know, tie it into real uh, idiopathic PD? And so that takes me back to the original uh, perfect storm where I told you that we have non-motor symptoms that uh, precede by a couple of decades the, the motor symptoms, and they include hyposmia, anxiety, depression, sleep disturbances, and GI dysfunction. And these um, uh, symptoms, presumably the GI dysfunction and all of these, uh, happen because, um, as Heiko Brock uh, proposed, because the synuclein is depositing in areas that regulate these processes, right? That the substantia nigra deposition of synuclein doesn't happen until you get to this stage, which is where you start getting the symptomatic phase and your clinical uh, symptoms for the diagnosis. But the pre-symptomatic phase involves things like locus ceruleus, which regulates sleep and makes norepinephrine, and all these other things that are regulating the other processes that give you the prodromal or non-motor symptoms. And up here, you got neocortex and other things that presumably regulate things like cognition and other things, which is, comes as a late symptom in PD. So it's this potential progression, right, of synuclein pathology that potentially spreads is one of the hypotheses. And where does it start? Well, potentially the, the periphery, and one of these peripheral organs might be the gut. So that's where that comes from. And so 60 to 80 percent of PD patients develop GI symptoms and Cordova and Shannon reported that, you know, you had high levels of enteric synuclein in PD patients relative to healthy controls. There's been other studies, and this study in particular is a little controversial since they found some synuclein in controls. And we have a whole bunch of uh, literature showing, you know, constipation and Lewy body pathology and PD patients having increased intestinal permeability. And then we have the very super interesting connection between Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease with Parkinson's, right? And, and so we and others have proposed that perhaps there is this potential connection, right? That if you have chronic inflammation in the gut by either disruption through chronic infections, inflammatory bowel disease, exposures through pesticides, anything, that you're going to create a leaky gut and that you're going to create inflammation, and that may serve as a trigger for synuclein aggregation and potential uh, passage from you know there to the vagus, which is connected um, from the gut up to the brain. Alternatively, you could just create inflammation, and through the circulation, you got circulating cytokines that make the BBB leaky. So there's plenty of potential options, and it doesn't have to be through the vagus, but potentially. It could be since there's some um, epidemiological data suggesting that people with vagotomies for ulcer treatment have as a group reduced incidence of idiopathic PD. So you cut the highway and maybe you reduce the risk. So intestinal dysfunction in PD is consistent with inflammatory uh, uh, conditions. And as I said, constipation has been there and um, what happens is that you get inflammation, you disrupt the microbiota, or potentially the microbiota gets disrupted first, and that creates inflammation, and you get leakiness between your intestinal epithelium, and then you get a lot of pro-inflammatory activity down here, and this is a feed-forward cycle. So it's not clear what comes first, the inflammation, infection, or the microbiota dysfunction, and it could really be either. Um, so Heidi Payami and many others have done dysbiosis studies. This was one of the most, um, not, there's not been like 20 something, but this was one of the most comprehensive ones where they sampled with two sticks, um, the, the, micro, the gut microbiome, and they found a whole bunch of pathways that were altered. Very, very interesting. 
And initially, people couldn't agree which bacteria were up and which ones were down. Um, and, and basically now there's been many, many studies, and this is from Velma Aho from Phil Shepardian's group in Finland. It's now mostly agreed that, you know, acromancia has increased and lactobacillus has increased, and these appear to be opportunistic pathogens, and these are decreased in PD, okay? So that's generally an agreement. And so we collaborated with Heidi Payami, and I said, well, you know, I don't really care that the bacteria are up or down. I want to know, is, is the host inflamed? Because you could have your bacteria out of whack, but what if you can compensate for that? And so we borrowed the second stick from Heidi Payami through an IRB, obviously, and Madeline Craw uh, Crawford, now Hauser, in my lab, um, extracted the protein, ran uh, mesoscale neuroinflammatory multiplexed immunoassays on the uh, protein, and we wanted to find how uh, inflamed the host was, okay? And we had spousal controls, which is important because you have to take into account the environment for looking at these factors. And so again, this is published in Movement Disorders. I won't go into all the details, but we accounted for all these um, things on the left and which make a difference and impact the microbiome. And we found four factors that were different between spouse and PD. Um, and we did have some females with PD. And so these four are very, uh, very significant between them. And they're all driven by NF kappa B. OK, and so we basically said, OK, uh, is there any evidence of NF kappa B increases uh, in the gut of, of patients? Um, and so we looked and sure enough, um, this is a different cohort, but PD patients have a lot of NF kappa B protein in the gut. This is a colonic biopsy and just a, a regular matched healthy control, not a spouse, um, has very little. Right, so we thought, wow, this is pretty remarkable. And this was recently published as well. And so we basically said, um, we need to replicate these findings in a different cohort. And so this was a separate study in Finland, um, mid-stage patients um, and controls. And this time we had uh, the ability to measure short chain fatty acids, which are supposed to be you know, anti-inflammatory. And we also did some measurements with plasma, which um, we didn't have in the Payami uh, collaboration. And so we found some really interesting things. We found that patient PD stool had lower short-chain fatty acid levels, which are supposed to be protective. And they had higher calprotectin levels. Now, calprotectin is the quintessential marker for IBD, is what my GI colleagues tell me. So that's interesting because now the PD patients are showing up with a marker that is in IBD, patients, so that strengthens the potential connection. We found higher levels of stool short-chain fatty acids and lower levels of inflammatory CXCL8 and IL-1 beta correlated with later onset of PD symptoms. So what does this mean? Well, it potentially suggests that if you have higher levels of short-chain fatty acids, you could have protection and later onset of PD symptoms. Interesting, but again, the hypothesis is that short chain fatty acids might be protected, but you would have to run the trial to see. This is just a association, certainly not implying causation. We found diversity and composition of the gut microbiota were associated with the severity of PD symptoms. And higher alpha diversity was associated with more severe PD symptoms. Again, functionally, we're not sure exactly, you know, what, what that means. And then we found some really interesting differences, which again, we don't really know what they mean, but we found some things only in controls, like bacteroides correlated with short chain fatty acids and stool and gal only in controls. And for instance, only in PD patients, the bifidobacterium inversely correlated with short chain fatty acids and positively with, with stool and gal. And then we found higher levels of stool zonulin correlated with less severe PD symptoms, right? And so zonulin is one of those tight junction proteins that keeps things tight in the barrier, right? And so that's, you know, that's a good thing, but if you're shedding it, then it may imply that your barrier is, is breaking down. And, and so this correlation, you know, didn't really make a whole lot of sense, but there it is. Okay, um, going the other direction. Now, this is an interesting take-home message. Um, 
we found that there is no correlation between your inflammatory uh, markers and in the in the blood and in the stool. So if you want to know if someone has gut inflammation, you got to sample the stool or the colonic biopsy. And if you want to know if someone has blood plasma inflammation, you got to sample the plasma because they don't reflect what's going on one in the other. So finally, the conclusions are that you know, there's bi-directional communication between the gut and the brain. We've known that for quite some time. John Cryan has done beautiful studies between that, um, showing that, you know, if you disrupt the gut microbiome, you're disrupting what's coming out of the bone marrow, you're disrupting the conversation with microglia. And we know that peripheral circulation is, you know, the gut brain peripheral circulation connection is key for brain health and that it breaks down as we get older immune cell aging and chronic inflammation resulting from the G times E interplay represents the perfect storm for PD development, and we postulate it underlies the early prodromal premotor features of PD. And in humans, the lifestyle choices that we make, the diet, exercise, or lack thereof, are all likely to affect this G times C interplay and to impact the gut and BBB permeability, which will influence neuroinflammation and risk for PD. And finally, mitigating chronic inflammation and chronic systemic inflammatory diseases like, you know, IBD and, you know, metabolic syndrome, leaky gut, fatty liver may all reduce innate immune dysfunction and risk for PD and its progression. And so this is the, the tripartite axis that I mentioned. We know that the brain is talking to the peripheral immune system through, you know, the cholinergic anti-inflammatory loop that Kevin Tracy talks about. We know that that microbiota is talking to the brain, and we know that the brain makes a lot of substances that regulate these two sites and vice versa. So it is in understanding the functional relationship between these three sites that will lead us to identification of more targets for therapeutic intervention. And to acknowledge the people that have done the work, some of this work was done at Emory um, by several graduate students and postdocs. And we are now in the Gator Nation at the University of Florida, continuing this work and uh, trying to target uh, inflammatory pathways, continuing with our um, TNF work and looking at second hit models and translating this um, hopefully into the clinic um, trying to find more non-invasive ways to interrogate um, inflammation, um, and, such as some of the, the uh, work that uh, we're doing in collaboration with Immune Bio, and, and looking at ways to interrogate um, neurodegeneration uh, with novel ways like, you know, Oxford um, Diagnostics is doing. So thank you very much, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Mallory. That's a comprehensive uh, summary and uh, uh, actually plenty to take in. I think we did appreciate looking at your papers first as well. Um, uh, I actually have a, a sort of a rather naive question to start with, uh, which relates to some of our work. Obviously, we've, we've, we're focused on looking at the brain um, and we look at brain anatomy and, um, for example, some measures that correlate uh, quite nicely with with some markers uh, of glial cells like trem2 and progranulate you know, things that that might be interesting markers so um i just wondered if you could say a little bit more about the uh, specifically around the glial cell um uh, sort of what we know about the glial cell responses and whether or not there's some interesting links to pursue there yeah um yeah. i i deliberately focused my talk more on the periphery in the gut for you guys, because I know you think brain almost too much. Um, but yes, we think about glial cells in, in the brain a lot. And and one of the thoughts, and we study progranulin and trim too, um, one of the thoughts that I have had for a long time, and, and we're actually going through this now and, and really testing that, that idea, is that, you know, the markers that we have been using to study microglia in the brain, um, starting, say, first with IBO1, right, um, are not specific markers for microglia, right? IBO1 marks all myeloid populations, right? And so, so does CD68. And so when people look at expression levels, um, either of, of mRNA for uh, markers of microglia that 
even those that they think become the dam microglia or non-homeostatic, right? Um, they're not necessarily just microglia, and we can yeah. see that with our flow cytosol gas. And what we're finding is that we need better ways to really distinguish the myeloid resident myeloid cells versus the infiltrating uh, myeloid cells or monocytes and others that are coming in because a lot of those markers are overlapping and mm. we need better imaging markers for them. Um, we have a lineage trace tracing animal that's allowing us to trace those myeloid cells that are coming from the periphery and that cross and they can no longer disguise themselves as microglia um, because they are, they're now going to be marked forever after they cross. So we're, we're starting to figure out how clever they are. And I think they've, they've misled many people into thinking they're microglia. So that's one. Um, mm. They express progranulin. They express, you know, a lot of things. They won't express TMM 119 right? But Chris Bennett has done a beautiful study. He started this whole thing doing some um, some studies that showed us which markers are on and never get turned off and which markers never get turned on when these cells enter and cross. So we think about glia in the brain a lot and I suspect that many of the instances in which we've credited microglia with stripping synapses it has not been just microglia. I strongly suspect that some of that damage has been aided and abetted by peripheral cells that have come in that we've not been able to detect um, because of the disrupted crosstalk and we need better imaging uh, markers for them because we just don't have any. Really interesting, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, respecting your comments about how we should also focus on the periphery as well, um, I, I'm sure there are some questions around that as, as well. So let me open it to everybody else. Uh, who would like to ask a question? Jed, you, I saw you. Yeah, just just because my question is quite closely related, I think. I, I was interested that you highlighted the, the relative independence of stool markers of inflammation and plasma markers of inflammation. I was just curious how uh, neuroinflammation might be more coupled to one or other of those, or if it's a kind of third independent process? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually think because of the conversation between the gut microbiome and microglia and T cells in the gut and them making, you know, IL-17 and other cytokines that act on receptors in the brain, I actually believe there might be a tighter conversation between the gut and the brain than the plasma in the brain. That's interesting. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And I, I think it's because the gut um, has an enteric nervous system and an immune system, and so does the brain, and the circulation and the plasma is, is the pipe. Right. Thank you. I'm making notes as well as we go, sorry. So, yeah, uh, Ian, I think you've got a question. Go ahead. Hi, Manny, that was uh, very fascinating. Thank you. Um, so, uh, is, is, the, is the immune system the key? Like, is that the thing that is causing the problem or is that just such an integral part of everything that happens in our bodies that we can't separate it out from anything? Great question. Um, I think that the genetics tell us that at least the GWAS hits, say for Alzheimer's disease, if I had given my Alzheimer's talk, I would tell you that the genetics and the GWAS hits, 60% of them are glial or oligodendrocyte specific. And I would tell you that that would tell me that these are immunological diseases of aging. And what I would say is that um, I would rephrase the amyloid hypothesis in a way that it has a different relationship to inflammation, that it's not that amyloid accumulates and then the microglia become, you know, really um, hyperinflammatory. I would say that um, you're born with genetics that um, are like a dance card and some of those genetic variants make microglia and monocytes a little sluggish and slow and they're vacuuming up the brain uh, debris, and it doesn't matter when you're young, but when you're older, it 
matters and it catches up to them. And um, in the fifth decade of life, um, the accumulation is such that um, you basically end up having an, you know, microglia monocyte immune driven um, proteinopathy that um, is basically a result of immune dysfunction due to aging and then whatever other environmental things you've layered on top of that. So I think that inflammation is not the cause per se in the genetic cases, but I do think that it's a different mechanism for sporadic versus genetic. And and somebody pinned me down on this at a talk the other day, and and I think that's basically what what I'm saying that that immune dysfunction is what happens with aging to all of us, and it's accelerated in some because of the environmental component, the genetics. It's an interplay, and some of us have a worse dance card than others. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm saying. Thanks. That really that really clears up a lot, actually. That's very good, and it's nice, isn't it? As you it's give these talks, I realize it's very controversial, but it gives you an opportunity to really intervene, and it really means that we've been doing it wrong. We've been thinking about it wrong, and 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 much too late. I mean, I think there's a, a general sense that we need to innovate in some of our concepts around this. So, I was just I was just saying, I think it's nice that. Um, as you said, as you give these talks, you are you are sort of thinking through what what it really comes what it boils down to because it's it's useful to communicate these things as, as straightforwardly as possible. Oh, you know, when when people <laughs> ask me questions like that, um, like the one Jed just asked me, it I have like a eureka moment all of a sudden. Yes, absolutely. This is this is why we this is why I do this because it it is a two way, uh, you know, conversation that helps me think through things as well. Yeah, that's great. Uh, OK, more questions then in that case. <laughs> Especially important. Uh, Dimitro, is that are you raising your hand? Yeah. Okay. Hello, thank you. Uh, I think you already you have said it already, but uh, so would you say that the more holistic uh, research approach uh, should be applied in other uh, neurodegenerative disorders? Uh, for example, look for intestine or gut biomarkers and not focus only uh, on the brain biomarkers. Yes, absolutely. I mean, almost all neurodegenerative conditions are likely to have an inflammatory component, right? And, and you know, LPS in the brain and in the CSF of ALS patients has been reported. Um, LPS and LBP, LPS binding protein, which gets made to stop up the LPS in your bloodstream um, is another potential biomarker for people to see if there's been a breach in the gut barrier. Um, it has been reported in a lot of people with neurodegeneration, right? So, so not everybody that has a neurodegenerative disease has like quite robust and detectable uh, inflammation in their circulation. If they did, they would be septic, right? They would be in the hospital. And so, it's very, it's very um, subtle in many ways, and it's compartmentalized, right? If it's in your gut, it's going to be in your gut. If it's in your brain, it's not going to be like inflammation when you stub your toe, because if you have that amount of inflammation in your brain, you have a skull, and so you, the intracranial pressure would be so much that you know you couldn't do it. So when microglia and even in, infiltrating cells invade your brain it has to be a very graded response, right? All the Celsius signs that we were, you know, the col uh, color, dollar, rubor, that does not apply in the brain unless you have a TBI, right? Unless you have a, a trauma, right? Neuroinflammation is a very graded response that does not involve that or you would, you know, because we have a skull that contains all that. And so it's a very different kind of thing and, 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 and there's no real resolving loops, right? So the chronic nature of things is what allows it to crank along for decades and eventually it catches up with you. Yeah, and, it's, and so yes, I think that many diseases, I mean, this is why we're seeing now the connections, I think, between metabolic syndrome and diabetes and uh, obesity, 
you know, with PD and with AD, right? And what I do worry about is the childhood epidemic of obesity and 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 overweightness, because that may potentially give uh, rise to earlier onset of these diseases, right? So our generation is seeing them in the 50s, 60s, 70s, like what's going to happen in the next generation, right? The other thing that we can, we're concerned about is, is the COVID epidemic, right? The chronic inflammation that persists in many people following that. What is that going to do to risk for PD and AD? And so it's a, it's a concern. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. I think that's right. Um, I, I think probably there's more questions. Yes, I've got also one written down and sent in to me, but Mario, you put your, put your, put your, put yours forward. Yeah. Hi, Mario. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your presentation. So while immune activation is well described in PD, its role in PD dementia probably has not fully well explored. So do you think that the different, uh, potential different, uh, nucleine deposition is spreading and its interaction with the immune response can help to understand the difference between PD and PDD? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's absolutely true. Um, I put together a grant at one point for DLB and PDD and is there a difference and what's the difference in the mechanisms? Um, I think it, it may have to do certainly with, um, you know, when you get your dementia versus, you know, when you get your motor symptoms and, 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 and the location of the deposition of synuclein um, and, and what the immune cells are doing with it. Um, but absolutely, I think that the order of operations and, and, and how immune cells um, handle the, the challenge is, is really, is really important. David Morgan did some really interesting studies a long time ago in the amyloid field where um, there were plaques in a mouse and he gave a really high injection of LPS and the microglia cleared the plaques, right? And then there's studies where if you, if you give very low dose LPS and you just kind of make the microglia kind of drowsy or, you know, pissed off, uh, they don't clear the plaques, right? So, we hypothesize that low dose chronic inflammation disrupts things in a way that makes the immune system dysfunctional, right? And sometimes when I give a talk, I wish I'd brought it, I give an analogy that that was actually has actually been presented for cancer, where in cancer and sepsis, you have a very uh, uh, long duration trigger that it does, does, it leads to dysfunctional activation of the uh, uh, immune system, but no resolving loops. And so it goes on and on and on, and it results in low grade uh, inflammation, uh, cytokine production, ER stress, and you, en you end up with um, you know, aberrant remodeling of, of tissue, cancer, you know, uh, suppressed innate immunity, right? And I saw that and I was like, you know, I could just add this, you know, uh, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and and IBD to the top, and everything else would be the same. And the bottom, instead of you know bad remodeling and cancer, it would be like neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration. And so I use that, and and people go, wow. And and I don't think I just think as neuroscientists, we've we've not been thinking of of the brain and the effects that the periphery and peripheral organs have on it. But it's the same for. Cardio, cardiovascular health and, and, and cancer prevention. Exactly the same. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and we need to do more on PDD. I think I think that um, there's lots of evidence that inflammation leads to cognitive decline and you know IL eight IL eight um, TNF um, circulating levels of those and um, in people <clears throat> tend to have effects on on cognitive decline and, and dementia, but there's not enough that's been done. Thank you. Very good. Yes, Jamie, go ahead. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, so my question really was just kind of based on diet and how, either how much impact you think that might have, whether it's a more inflammatory diet and whether there is a kind of diet that reduces the inflammation over long term to a significant level that might be 
Yeah, that's a great question. So <clears throat> um, I have a, several colleagues here at UF. Um, Carly Rush uh, is fantastic. Um, they are doing these kinds of studies. And while there's no consensus on which kind of diet is best, um, I think the, the idea that you want to um, lower the, um, the sugar content and the fat content, right? You want to have, you know, veg to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, fiber um, that you uh, want to exercise, and um, you know that you want to um, make sure that you sleep well, um, because the clearance mechanisms for anything that's free and aggregated happens at night. Um, if you don't sleep, you know, you do have a greater risk for these diseases. Um, I wasn't. I never took that seriously, but now I am. Um, and and our preclinical studies do suggest that high fat, high fructose, especially the fructose part, the sugar part, is especially uh, bad for insulin resistance in the brain. And um, and we've done some studies that we're about to submit that I presented at other meetings, showing that soluble TNF inhibition is able to block that um, fatty liver formation and is able to prevent some of the bad diet induced synaptic deficits that you see in an amyloid model and in just a regular mouse. So I would say that, you know, some people say Mediterranean diet is good. Um, I would say anything that's just not high fat, high sugar is, is probably a good idea. In the end, it needs to be something that's sustainable, and that's the key, that you can't do a diet that you cannot uh, commit to. That's that's the wrong approach. So it can be more of a, it, it's kind of a couple of things that you should try and avoid rather than things that you need to include almost. Exactly, exactly, yes. And, and I think people should be just very careful, you know, to go spend a lot of money on expensive diets or probiotics yeah. or things like that. That that's not, you know, that, well, it's been shown that some diets can change your gut health. It, there's been no good scientific evidence that changing the gut health can actually reduce your risk of neurodegeneration. Those studies just have not been done. But if changing your gut health makes you feel better, then, you know, go for it. Because I think that that is, you know, that is a big deal. Thank you. Very good. And Michele, you've got a question? Go ahead. Yes. Well, hi, hi Mala. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, we've talked about diet and sleeping well and environmental factors um, being important in preventing PD. Are, are they important for other neurodegenerative diseases as well? Is there a, a common lifestyle maybe that we can adopt to prevent a wide variety of diseases? Or is there more specific things that we should avoid or do? depending on what disease we want to prevent? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. You know, as I said before, I think as neuroscientists, we were very um, closed minded to the idea. I mean, we thought that the brain was a, an immune privileged organ um, and it wasn't seeing anything outside of it. And it's wrong. It's an immune specialized organ um, and really the same recipe for cardiovascular health and cancer prevention applies here. And so um, and applies to all the neurodegenerative diseases, um, uh, especially those of age, because as you as you get older, you're you're subjected to chronic antigenic load, which means you know a lot of infections, a lot of things in in, you, in the environment, and those are like a dance card, and it's like a hit, another hit, another hit, and they eventually you know add up. And if you have good genetics, then you know you don't cross that threshold. But if you don't have good genetics, and so far you can't control that. Um, you can control the environmental piece to a great extent. And so that's the good news. The good news is that, you know, the G times Z, the E part is in your hands to a very large extent. And what we would like to say is, you know, it's in your hands from childhood and the good habits um, should start very early. And we need a public health campaign um, for, for brain health the way we uh, came up with it for, for heart health and for cancer prevention. And, and, and we're living longer and longer. And when you look at the 
centenarians and others that have lived long and you say, what's your secret? They tell you that they walk. They walk a lot. They, they don't do the treadmill. They don't do CrossFit. Um, they just walk. And so the recipe is pretty simple. Um, I think, you know, good health, good diet, walking and and sleeping. I think sleeping is really key and we had not appreciated that. Great, thank you. I think um, uh, unless anyone has a really urgent question to squeeze in at the end, I think probably we need to we need to finish up there, Malu. Um, but uh, I, I would like to just lead everyone's thanks to you for talking to us today. Uh, and certainly it's the case that, you know, at OBD, we're looking at Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, but we're also looking beyond that at a range of conditions. Our technology, we, we believe, can be applied to a lot of things. So uh, the breadth of some of this discussion, especially the latter stages a lot of, across a lot of things, I think is very relevant to us. And thank you for talking to us about Parkinson's disease, which is one of, one of our interest areas at the moment. So. Uh, uh, I'm sure we'll have further conversations, but thank you for your time today. Absolutely. I'm happy to do a follow up with any of you. Just email me and we can continue the conversation uh, offline. Thank you for the invite.